Oh, I need your help to finish the phrase. No pain? I hate that phrase. I really do. And what I've learned is that often it's true. I'm just hearing Jake talk about the painful experience of being um, in trouble with his dad. You never probably knew that that would be a connection one day that someone would, would connect to and then decide to follow Jesus. But I find that pretty stinking amazing. But that's not what I'm talking about at all right now because I don't like that phrase. I don't like it at all. And I had an experience recently, and some of you, you understand what I'm talking about when you say you had a painful experience at Thanksgiving time. Um, my, my experience is probably a lot different than yours. Maybe it's the same. I don't know. But this past Thanksgiving, we were preparing for the food, which is one of the most important parts. Am I right? Yes, I am correct. Um, we get really excited about the food. And so we were, we were thinking about, okay, we need to have our Thanksgiving meat ready because we don't make it. We buy it from the best place in the world to buy that kind of meat at that time of year, which is honey baked hams. And so we're like, we're not going to do the Griswold Christmas. We're, we're not going to ever do that. We're going to make sure that it's good because we're going to have a feast. And so I want Brooke to pre-order or pre-make our reservation so that we have our Thanksgiving meat ready for us at the right time. And she's not doing it in the time frame that I think she should. And she's dragging her feet. And so I'm like, I'm just going to make the reservation for our Thanksgiving meat. And so I call and I'm thinking, I want it to be as fresh as possible. So when should I do that? I'm going to do it the day before Thanksgiving. And she told me after I did that, she said that, I don't think that was a good idea. I was like, how bad could it really be? I mean, really? Come on. So Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, I get on East Chester Drive, crossover 311. I turn into the parking lot. And for the first time ever, I experience a parking lot where I cannot find a parking space there where the Barbaritos is and the Honey Baked Hams is. And I'm driving around for 10 minutes. I'm going, uh-oh, this might be bad. And eventually I park on a curb, you know, hoping I don't get towed. And I start walking toward the entrance, only to see when I get toward the entrance that there's a line snaking about the length of a football field around the, the neighboring businesses. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so I take my walk of shame over to the end of the line, hearing the words of Brooke in my head saying, that's probably not a good idea. And I'm sitting in the back of the line, and about maybe three minutes later, a group of teenagers walk out. The teenagers walk out just to make me feel worse, maybe about who I am as a person. And they look at all the people in the line, and they start laughing and pointing at us. And they're like, heck, yeah, guys. They didn't say heck. They said, get your hams. <laughs> I want to get your. I was... Standing in the back of that line, and I'm taking these baby steps, and I'm like, all right, I don't like lines. They create anxiety. Um, they, they're painful. I, I, I'm thinking, should I stay or should I go? And then I start envisioning the future of going home and telling my kids, hey, we're going to have a feast for Thanksgiving, and it's going to be vegetarian. <laughs> and I envision them looking at me going, up yours. They, I mean, they, they like their meat. And so I'm like, I cannot do that. That's not a good option. And so I'm like, okay, maybe I can do something productive while I stand in this line. And so I pull out my cell phone because I'm a recovering productivity addict. Some of you understand what I'm talking about. And I decide I'm going to check my email, which I mean, who likes to do that? But I'm like, I got to do it. So I'm checking my email, trying to check my email. And I realize that the data connection is like zero or as they might say in Alamance counting, it's terrible. It's just terrible, terrible. So I pocket my phone and I stand there and I'm taking these baby steps. And I do what is like the last resort and I decide to talk to somebody. And, <laughs> right? So I turn around and, and the guy behind me looks nice. So we start having a conversation and it's going pretty good. And then he asked me the question that when I get asked, it's like, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how they're going to react. And it's, what do you do for a living? And in that moment, I'm tempted to say, I work for the most powerful being in the world. 
but that's weird. So I say something even weirder. I'm a pastor. And then the eyes oftentimes get big. Some people say, great. And then some people, you can tell they're thinking about like, what did I say in the last five minutes? And I've had people literally say, I'm so sorry. Or they start saying, hey, brother, that's so great to hear, brother. And they say brother like 20 times and they're like nervous. And I'm like, why are you acting so weird? You're freaking me out. And so he didn't do that, which it would have made the experience much more painful. And so we actually had a good conversation. We talked about college football, which is a painful subject for me today. So I don't want to talk about it. But we stood in that line and I got to the front of the line and I emerged 57 minutes later, victorious, holding a half ham and a half smoked turkey, walking out like they were trophies. And I felt like there should be like a cheering section, but there wasn't. And I walked to my truck and I drove home and told my wife she was right. Um, That was a painful experience. And all of you can relate to that. Um, I would say that if we were talking about painful experiences, you could relate to something maybe even much deeper than that, especially this time of year. Like I've, I've talked to uh, two sets of friends recently and, and they were anticipating Thanksgiving. This is a couple weeks ago, obviously. And they said, I mean, Thanksgiving's coming. It's, uh, and I, I said, well, what are you going to do to deal with a dynamic that makes you go, uh, they said wine, lots of wine. And I'm like, okay, well, that is an option, right? And wine is an option. But I started thinking about pain and how real it is this time of year. As we reflect on the year past, we reflect on years past of what they did or what they didn't do. And we start thinking about who's going to be there and who's not going to be there, who can't be there anymore. And the pain can start bubbling to the surface. And then you throw in the expectations, because a lot of times you're getting with people that you know for, you've known for a long time and you have these emotional connections too, but you don't see them that often. And there's connections that the, or there's expectations that these connections are going to be great. And it's almost like you're just set up to fail. You ever just feel that way? Like I'm walking into this family situation and I'm probably going to fail. I'm probably going to disappoint somebody. My mom's going to throw that guilt on me for the 20th billionth time. And it's just like, ugh. And then you throw in the things that start coming out of that, like the, the, the anxiety that starts building up and the stress. What can, then it leads to depression. And I mean, if we really want to be honest about it, sometimes we have suicidal thoughts. I mean, they can come to the surface this time of year based on whatever we're dealing with. And it can feel really dark. And the pain is real. Because you see, pain is part of the human experience. If I were to go around with a microphone and I were to say, hey, tell me about your pain. Every single one of you could tell me about pain being part of your experience. And a lot of it is tied to our relationships. As a matter matter of fact, almost all of it is tied to our relationships, both in what we reflect on and what we expect And as we talk about this, some of you are like, this is really depressing. Well, we're not going to stay there. Because see, last week we talked about uh, the first verse of O Holy Night. And Pastor Jonathan did a wonderful job of, of taking truth from that old Christmas classic. And he talked about how Jesus' birth introduced something new and true hope. And we're going to build on that today. And and to do that, we're going to look at the second verse of O Holy Night and hopefully see it in a brand new way. And it goes like this. The king of kings lay thus in lowly manger in all our trials, born to be our friend. He knows our needs to our weakness is no stranger. I want to camp out for a second on the King of Kings. Just saying about that. King of Kings means he's number one. Can you imagine just for a second what it would be like if you had number one ranking or all the power in the world? You were the most powerful person in the world. And you had one um, chance to make your appearance on a particular scene. How would you choose to appear? I mean, I'm going 
all out, guys. Mardi Gras parade. Woo! No, not that. I wouldn't do that. But I'm going big. I, I want it to be festive. I want it to have all the trappings of a big party. And the king of kings, what does he do? He comes in a lowly manger. And we kind of sanitize that, the, the idea of the, the baby being in the manger. But a manger was a feeding trough. It was a plate for cattle and pigs. And in Luke chapter 2, there's one mention of manger. We don't see it anywhere else in the Bible. But Luke was a very meticulous doctor who wrote an account of Jesus' life. And he's writing about where Jesus was born and, and, and where he essentially was laid, his first bed, his first crib in Luke chapter 2. And this is after a 100-mile hike. Now, imagine for, for a second taking a 100-mile hike, being your third trimester. And men, you can't imagine that. But that would be painful. And so in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, Luke writes this. Mary gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room, no lodging available for them. And I want to break it down in looking at what Mary's pain must have been like. Third trimester, people are coming up to you saying, when's the baby coming? Like constantly, you're like, I don't know, whenever it comes. Or they're touching your belly and they don't even know you. You ever have that happen? Like a stranger touches your belly? Oh, you're carrying low. It's going to be a boy. What? <laughs> don't touch me. And she's going through all these things that are really human. Third trimester, she didn't even get pregnant the way that people get pregnant. Like she's virgin birth type thing. It's crazy. I can't imagine what that would be like, the stress, the anxiety. And then there's a mandatory worldwide census where she has to go 100 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And so she takes this journey without the comforts that we have today. And she gives birth without medication. Imagine that for a second. Ooh, I don't know what that feels like. But it had to be horrible, like in, in the sense of pain. And then you got Joseph. Imagine being Joseph. You're taking on this responsibility and you're like, I don't know what this is really all about, but I know that God told me to, so I'm doing it. And he's trying to attend to her needs. And he's a teenager. And he has no experience. And then you have Jesus. Jesus being very human and God all at the same time. Leaving the comfort and warmth of, of his mother's womb. Not to mention heaven. And coming into a cold world. In a barn. And then his first bed being the plate for a a cow, or a plate for a horse, or a plate for a donkey, or a plate for a pig. And that's where he's laid down. Doesn't sound like a very idealistic way to come into this world. But it, the King of Kings chose to come in a lowly way. And if we fast forward throughout his life, we see him doing things where it doesn't make sense. Like he should elevate himself, but he chooses to lower himself. And it doesn't make any sense because he has all the power, yet he chooses to use it in a brand new way. And if we fast forward to the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews writes about the greatness of Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, he writes, the writer writes some incredible words about who Jesus is and his understanding of human pain. And so he writes this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. 
And what he's writing here has ties to the sacrificial system that, hey, we're having to sacrifice to appease God, to cover our sin. But Jesus was a once and for all sacrifice. And not only did he come in with a, in a lowly way, when the way, with the way he was born, but he died a lowly death, a death that a prisoner would die, a shameful death to pay the price for your sins and for mine, which makes him the great high priest. We no longer have to go through a priest to get to God because Jesus was that priest. He was that connection. He was that sacrifice. And then he goes on to write this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize. I love this word, empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. It was so critically important for Jesus to come and be like us in order to die for us. It was so important for him to feel pain, to know you and to know me. See, in all our trials, he knows our pain. He's not a stranger to weakness. In all our trials, he was born to be our friend. And in the middle of our pain, he is there to empathize and to feel on the level. Because a lot of times in our pain, we feel so alone and isolated and no one sees us and no one cares. But God does because Jesus did. And that's a truth you can hang on to this Christmas that maybe makes it different. And then in verse 16, he builds up to this. So let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Because of what he did, he is now approachable. He knows me and he accepts me right where I am when I trust in him as my savior so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The thing that's amazing about when you receive the love of Jesus is he gives you the presence of mercy and the presence of grace. And when you open up the presence of mercy, you're opening up no more judgment. He withholds his judgment from you. And when you open up the presence of grace and you rip off the wrapping paper of it and you open it up and you receive his love, he's giving you what you don't deserve, the forgiveness you don't deserve, the comfort you don't deserve, that we don't deserve. He's giving it to you all by just receiving him. So he says, because of what I did, you can approach me with confidence because I understand your pain. And as I reflected on a holy night, and as I reflected on these passages of scripture and Jesus's life and how he came and how he died, two big takeaways emerged for me. And they're this, that Jesus' birth introduced a new way of leadership. It was no longer this top-down type leadership. He didn't come pounding his chest saying, yeah, I made you. Yeah, and I'm going to help you out. I'm going to throw you a bone. I'm going to give you eternal life if you receive me. Nope. He came and was born, and his first bed was a plate for a cow. He chose to come in a lowly way, not grandstanding parade type way. And instead of top down, it was bottom up. And as you look back and you read through his life, the accounts of his life and the Gospels, you see him washing the feet of his disciples and doing things that make no sense. But he flipped true leadership on its head and says, it's not about being big and large and in charge. It's about saying, I'm going to be lowly in my approach and I'm going to help the people above me be successful. I'm going to help the people above me in their pain. I'm going to help love people to greatness. He understands our pain. And then secondly, Jesus' birth introduced a friend who understands our pain. If you were to stop and think for a minute, 
right now is the most painful thing to you. It wouldn't take you long to think what that is. They emerge very quickly, those thoughts, whether it's family, finances, friends. He understands because he's been like you and like me. He's had those weaknesses. So what do we, what do, we do with all that? Like what's the next step for us? And I would say, if you would say, you know what, Brian, I haven't chosen to follow Jesus yet. I haven't placed my trust in him as my savior. Your next step is to just receive his love, to receive his mercy, to receive his grace, to invite him in and begin to experience his friendship and just soak it in and watch him change you from the inside out, much like these three boys did this morning. But some of you, you're like, I've been walking with Jesus for years. Man, I've known him for years. He's been my friend through so much pain for years. Your next step is to think about how are you leading? How are you leading with the resources God has given you? And I was thinking about this, and it made me flash all the way back to 1996, which some of you are like, I wasn't even born in 1996. But 1996 was a life-changing year for me. In 1996, I, I was invited by my little brother to go to a church service where it was full of college students and single adults. And I didn't want to go because I'd just been through a bad breakup. And I felt like life was just really low and bad. And I was in a lot of pain and I didn't want to go. My brother said, you need to go, you need to go, you need to go. And I finally said, yes. And I walked in, I remember walking in the room and I couldn't believe what they had put together for college and single adults. And that night, what I realized when they talked is that Jesus was my friend in my pain. He was meeting me right where I was, that I had been really messed up and done a lot of bad things. And yet he was there to love me despite me. He was a friend in my pain. And right now, as I reflect on it, even today, I think about what did it take for people to, to create that environment. There are people who invested their time. There are people who invested their money to make that environment happen that I will never meet, that I have never met. Why would they do that? I believe they did that because they understand that Jesus' birth introduced a new way of leadership, that their resources that their, their, their money, their time, it wasn't just theirs. It was given to them, and they were stewarding it by saying, you know what, I'm going to offer it to build the kingdom of God, even though I may never see the results of it. And what I can't wait to do is one day when I'm in heaven is to meet those people and to say thank you because you saved me from exponentially more pain because of what you did, because of your sacrifice because you saw a bigger picture than what was happening right here, right now. So what is it for you? I want to land with sharing, you, sharing with you these scriptures about who Jesus was and his new way of leadership from Philippians chapter 2. He wrote this in Philippians chapter 2, Paul. He wrote, don't look out for your own, own interest, but take an interest in others. To. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death. Go back, please. You are on the point and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What would happen 
in this local church alone, if we embraced this bottom up mindset of leadership like Jesus did? What could happen in our community as we go around and share the love of Jesus? That people would see that we're for them. That people would see we want something for, for them, not something just from them. What would happen if, as a group of believers, we said, you know what, we're going to leverage our resources and time in a brand new way so that people can find life now, so that people can avoid pain now, so they know Jesus is, in, is their friend in their pain. That's why he came. And that's why he lived the life he lived. And that's why he died the death he did to show us the way. Jesus' birth introduced a new way of leadership and a friend who understands our pain. How does that impact you this Christmas? Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much just for the reminder from the song, Oh Holy Night. We thank you so much for the words of, of Jesus being the king of kings, but coming in a lowly manger. And that in all our trials, he was born to be our friend. And he knows our need to our weaknesses, no stranger. We thank you for those powerful words. And we thank you for the powerful way that he leveraged his leadership and his friendship toward us. I pray as a summer church, Jamestown, that we would see a bigger picture with our lives and with our pain. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.